I'm Luna. I'm gonna read Magic Tree Elf's Merlin Mission. High time for heroes. Chapter One. I know her. Jack sat in the su- sunny spot on the front porch, studying the book of magic tricks. He was planning to put on the magic show for his parents and grandparents. He took a sip of lemonade, then started making a list in his notebook: flying paper clips. Hey, and he tapped on the screen door. Let's do something. I'm already doing something," said Jack. He took another sip. Of lemonade and added more tricks to his list: magical cleaning pan, great pepper trick, and just did you hear that? She asked. She opened the door and came out in onto the porch. Hear what? Said Jack. He added another trick: steal the third trick, the wishing sound. Said Annie. Wishing sound. Jack read his la- list and. Decided he still needed two, more, two or three more tricks, like the tree elves just wished in the woods. Said Annie. Yeah, yeah. Said Jack. He flipped through the he- pages of his book. Come on, go with me. Annie pleaded. Let's check the woods again, please. We've already checked five times since Tuesday. Said Jack. Once more, don't won't kill you," said Annie. "I have this feeling. I'm serious." Jack said. "Okay, you win," he said. One more time, he put his notebook and pencil into his backpack, leaving his book of magic tricks on the porch. He stood up and followed Annie down the steps and across their yard. "Aren't you dying to find another secret of greatness for Mer- Merlin?" Annie asked as they headed up the sidewalk. And what about the magic mist? Don't you want to have another great talent for an hour? Of course," said Jack. "But I'm so tired of looking, looking for the treehouse and not finding it. For two weeks you've had these hunches." Jack and Annie crossed the street and hurried into the far creek woods, wind, winding through the shadows of trees. Jack took a deep breath, inhaling. Inhaling, inhaling, inhaling the scent of warm earth and summer leaves. Heidi and Bert sang from the tree branches. As Jack and Annie drew closer to the tallest oak, Jack's heart started to pound. This time, something was there, high in the branches of tree. Which Annie said softly. Jack grinned as he looked up at the small wooden house nestled high in the branches. Okay, he said, "I'm glad we checked." Annie ran to the rope ladder and started up. Jack followed. Inside the magic tree, Elsa shouted her friendships, danced on the wooden walls. A piece of paper, a golden ring, the tiny bottle, a small book, and a scroll were waiting on the floor. A new message from Merlin said Annie. She picked up the scroll, unrolled it, and read aloud. Dear Jack and Annie, I hope you enjoy your time with the Houdinis. I ask you now to find the third secret of greatness from the woman named Florence Florence Nightingale. Florence Nightingale said Annie. I know her. I I gave a report on her. I just know her name. Who is she? Said Jack. She's amazing. She's one of my heroes," said Annie. "Yeah, okay, but what did he, not, what did she do?" asked Jack. Florence Nightingale lived in the eighteen hundred in England," said Annie. "The English army were fighting in this place called Crimea." On the Black Sea, and Florence Nightingale was a nurse there. The soldiers called her. The lady with the lamp, because after the hospital was quiet and dark at the night, she went alone from the bed to bed to bed with the lantern. She gave a light and comfort and took care of wounds. She was so brave and amazing. She became famous everywhere. Later, she changed the world of nursing by organizing. Okay, you didn't have to give your whole report. Jack interrupted. I give. I get the picture. She sounds cool. Let's go meet her. I feel like I already know her," said Annie with a laugh. "Oh wow! I can't wait. So let's see where we're going," 
said Jack. He picked up the small book from the floor. It started to later hover out an old-fashioned book. Look, I'll, I'll bet it's about England, said Annie over the Crimea. Neither, said Jack. She showed the cover to Annie. Egypt, said Annie. I never read that Florence Nightingale was a nurse in Egypt. We've been to Egypt before," said Jack. "Remember the mummy in the pyramid, the ghost queen?" said Annie. She was on her way to the next life. Jack shivered. That was weird," he said. "Don't worry, the ghost queen was thousands of years in the past," said Annie. "Now we're just going to 1850." "Oh, right," said Jack. "Really? I guess all the ancient ghosts were gone by then." "Whatever." "Ready?" said Annie. Hold on," said Jack. He picked up the gold ring and gave it to Annie. "It's your turn. It's your turn to wear this," he said. Annie slipped the ring on onto her finger. Then both stared at it for a moment. Then the ring was magic. When Florence Nightingale shared the secrets of greatness with them, it would glow like a burning ember. The ring of truth," said Jack. "Said Annie." Yep, just remember to keep checking it while you're we're talking to Florence," said Jack. "Don't worry, I will," said Annie. "Here, you carry this." She picked up the tiny glass bottle and handed it to Jack. Jack held the bottle up to the dappled sunlight and looked at the silver vapor swirling inside. Miss gathered at the first light on the first day of the new moon on the Isle of Avalon. He said. Yep, good for one one hour of great talent," said Annie. Jack smiled, remembering their hour as horse trainers and their hour as stage magician. I wonder what will be a great at this time," he said. "Maybe what? Maybe great nurse, nurses," said Annie. "We'll see," said Jack. He put the tiny bottle in his backpack. Danny picked up the piece of paper from the floor. On the paper, he had written the two secrets of greatness that had already turned humility, hard work. Ready to find the third secret from Flora's Nightingale? He asked. A thousand times yes," said Annie. She pointed at the picture of the cover of the traveler's handbook to Egypt. "I wish we could go there," he said. The wind started to blow. The trail started to spin. It spun faster and faster. Then everything was still, after absolutely still. Chapter two. Welcome to Tibet. Tibet. Warm, dry air filled the trails. Jack wore a helmet-type hat, leather boots, a long-sleeved shirt, and a pair of heavy-lined pants with a leather belt. A large pouch was pouch was a, a, attached to the belt. I wish I was dressed like you," said Annie, making a face. She was wearing a long white dress with frilly lace. "You look like a cool explorer." Explorer. I look like I'm going to a tea party. Don't feel bad," said Jack. "My clothes are really scratchy and heavy." Eha! Is that a donkey?" said Annie. She and Annie, she and Jack, out look out the window of the trees. Leaves and branches completely block their view. I think we landed in this. Come more tree," said Jack, studying the leaves. Annie pushed some branches aside. All they could see below were the more leaves. But straight ahead, in the distance, was a wide plain, plain dotted with sand-colored ruins. Beyond the plain, mountains loomed against the cloudless blue sky. The Egyptian sun was blindingly bright. Hee haw! That's definitely a donkey," said Annie. "Let's go look." She gathered up her long white dress and threw it down the rope ladder. Jack stuck a small handbook into the his leather pouch. He saw that he, his notebook, his pencil, and the bottle of magic mist were also inside the pouch, along with some coins that showed the imagine some parables. Hey, we have some Egyptian money. He called down to Annie. "Great, come down, come on down," said Annie. 
She was already on the ground. Jack buckled his pouch, then clim- clumsy, clumsily climbed down the rope ladder in his ladder leader boots. As soon as he stepped onto the grass, flies landed, landed on his face. He shook he- his head and waved his hands, trying to brush them away. The sa- sycamore tree was surrounded by bushes and another plant, a lush green river bank. Across the river, several dozen sailboats were assured near the temple. Hee haw! The sounds came from the beyond the bushes. Jack and Annie stepped around the dam and peeked out. Yep, thank you, two of them, said Jack. And there's a little kid with them. About fifty th- feet down the river, two small donkeys were standing under the cl- cluster of, of palm trees. They were shaking their long, fur- furry ears and switched their tails to keep the fiola- so- fleas away. Flies away. Flies, flies away. A boy was napping in a rowboat on the river bank. He was he wore a striped robe. Want to talk to him? Said Annie. Sure. Said Jack. They walked out of the bushes and headed headed toward the boy. Hello, Annie called. A small voice scrambled out of the rowboat. He looked he looked to be only six or seven. I did not see you coming, he said. Welcome to the Zebus. My name is Ali. Do you need donkeys and a guide? No thanks, said Jack. My grandmother, my grandfather is the best guide in the Zebus. Ali said with pride. He is returning now with. To travelers from England, there he is on the horse. In the distance, a white-bearded man wearing a turban, a turban, was riding in a pack horse. He was leading the man and woman on donkeys toward the river. After my grandfather rose down across the Nile to their boat, he can guide you to tombs in the cliffs," said Ali, "or temple the of Luxor." He pointed to the temple across the river. Thanks, maybe later," said Jack. "We're we are here every day. Come back," said Ali, and he ran to meet his grandfather and the travelers were from England. We just learned a lot," Jack said to Annie. "It seems we landed in Thebes, Egypt, on the River Nile, across across from the Temple of Luxor. Sounds like a fairy tale," said Annie. Jack pulled out their Egypt handbook. He found the Thebes and read aloud. Travelers enjoy visiting the area of Thebes in Egypt. Four thousand years ago, the Egyptian city was the capital, capital of no, the known world. At that time, it was the noisiest and liveliest place on the River Nile. Seriously," said Jack. He looked around at the quiet river bank and the donkeys. The And the distant bare mountains. I guess times have changed for Tivis," said Annie. "No kidding," said Jack. "So I wonder what Florence Nightingale is doing here." "Nursing," said Annie. "She has to be. That's what she's famous for. Maybe those English travelers know something about her." Annie pointed to the couple riding with Alice's grandfather. "Remember, Florence was from England too." Jack and Annie watched the three riders arrive at the river bank. Alice's grandfather climbed from climbed off his back back pack horse and helped a couple of their donkeys. As Ali and his grandfather gave a donkey water, the English woman noticed Jack and Annie. "Hello, children," she called, waving. Jack and Annie waved back, and the couple headed toward them. How delightful to see new faces in Davis! The woman said. "Yes,、yeah, said the man, smiling. Who are you? Where are you from?" The man and the wo- woman were both stout and middle-aged, but they had a young, exuberant air about them. "I'm Annie. Annie is bri- my brother, Jack," said Annie. "We're from." Frankfurt, Pennsylvania. Americans, wonderful," said the woman. "We're from England. My name is Selina Bracebridge. 
I'm traveling with my husband Charles. And Charles, and I am that very Charles. The Charles, with whom are you two traveling? Uh, our parents said Annie, but they left us our own in Tibet to visit the ruins," said Jack. "That they said it would be um a great educational experience. What a brave American children you are," Selina said. "At what unusual parents, indeed. And where are you?" Brave American children staying," said Charles. "Um, uh, up the Nile that way," said Annie. She waved her hand, hand vaguely, vaguely toward the treehouse. In the little house, it's sort of like a inn. I see. Good, good," said Charles. "Well, can we do anything to help you?" With your Davis educational experience, Jack could tell the man was joking, but Annie answered right away. Actually, you can help us," she said. "Have neither of, neither of you heard a woman of name Florence Nightingale at the place we're staying? Someone said she was in Davis." Selena's eyes wide, widened in amazement. "Charles, did you hear that? They're looking for Flo." Jack looked at Annie, then back at Charles and Selina. You know F- Florence Nightingale? He said, "Know her? She's our best friend." Said Selina. She's traveling with us. For goodness' sake! She pointed at the sailboat, a church lo- along, anchored, al- along the river. For many weeks now, she has been sailing up and down the Nile with us. In our boat," said Charles. "That is amazing," Annie said to Jack. "Totally," he said. "How did you two know Flo?" asked Alina. "We we don't well we don't actually know her," said Annie. "We just know she's the world famous nurse." "A what?" said Alina. "A world famous nurse," said Annie. "Like a nurse in the hospital." Charles and Selina both laughed. Oh no," said Selina. "Not Flo. She's helping sick rel- relatives and villagers in their homes. But she's not at least a bit, not the least bit famous for that. And she certainly never worked in the hospital," said Charles. "I'm afraid you found the wrong Florence Nightingale." "Oh," said Jack. "How many Florence Nightingales can there be?" he wondered. "But your Flo's." Great person, right? And he said, "We certainly think so." Said Sal- Selina. Well, then we'd still like to meet her. Said Annie. Righto. Said Selina. Flo was visiting the Temple of Luxor this morning. Why don't you come with us, our to our boat, 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 and wait for her to come back? Oh, thank you. Said Annie. Th- excellent. Said Charles. Must have. Must. Mustafa will ferry us across the you know in his rowboat. He turned to the beard guide and his grandson. Mustafa, shall we be off? He called goodbye, Ali. A boy waved goodbye, and his grandfather pulled the rowboat part way into the water. Children first, said Charles. Mustafa held the rowboat steady as Jack and Annie climbed aboard and sat down. Then he helped Charles and Selina aboard and climbed in after them. At、uh, once, every every was everyone was settled. Mustafa pushed off shore with his horse. Started rowing across the Nile. As the boy boat glided over the sun sparkling water, the old Egyptian softly sang a song. Jack couldn't understand the words, but the song was mo- soothing. Song in rhythm with the movement of oars. This is perfect, and it whispers. Now all we have to do is spend time with Florence Nightingale and wait for the cr- ring. Ring of truth to glow. Yeah, but she's not a great nurse. She whispered. Jack, feigning a wet away the flies. She's not. She's not famous for being great at anything. I know that's a little confusing. And he whispered back. Look, children, said Charles. Is that a magnificent? Magnificent sight. He pointed to a huge crocodile sunning itself on a river, on a river rock. 
Whoa, said Jack. Yikes, said Annie. At the same time, the crocodile has scaly green hide with black spots. Its green eyes glimmered, glimmered as the ro robot, robot, passed by. Don't be alarmed, said Charles. Charles. In our experience, not all cro crocodiles are. Completely harmless. Harmless crocodiles? Thought Jack. I don't think so. Mustafa stopped singing as they reached into a landing on the opposite river bank. He climbed out from, for, of the rowboat and tied it up. Then he helped Annie and Jack onto the bank. Selina and Charles followed. Charles handed some money to the guide. Thank you, Mustafa, he said. Please wait on this shore, as I believe Miss Nightingale plans to visit the western Thebes later today. When well, it's a bit cool cooler this way, children. Jack and Annie followed Charles and Selina as they walked briskly brick al along the landing, passing the line of sailboats moored at the water's edge. Whose boat they are? Are they are, are those? Asked Annie. They are rent by travelers from all over the Europe. Europe, such as most of whom were hiding from the midday heat right now. I don't, I don't blame them. Thought Jack. The heat and the flies were almost, almost more than he could bear. He felt sorry for the workers on the boats that. Decks, scrubbing floors and matting sails. Here we are," said Selina. She and Charles stopped at the largest boat on, anchored on the, on the river. Home, sweet home.